ba 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 Good day and welcome. I'm Joey and this is Orange 20. For the next few episodes, I want to talk about designing different types of adventures for your tabletop role-playing games. I'll be using D&D as the example game, but the advice should be pretty system agnostic, and I'll talk a little bit about how each of these adventures might look outside of a fantasy RPG setting. The first one we'll be looking at is the Dungeon Crawl. I feel this is the most classic and traditional style of adventure, and that's why our oldest role-playing game has it right there in the title. Generally, the idea behind this style of adventure is you're going to go into a dangerous location, you're willing to harm whoever lives there, and you want to extract something of value out of there. In the oldest published adventures I've read, it often seemed that the rumor of a dungeon or a map to a dungeon was reason enough for a party of adventurers to go there. They didn't really need any reason to partake in some good old-fashioned murder hobery. Hobery. Hoboism? wandering around killing stuff for money. I think the way we play the game has changed a lot, and now you generally need a better reason for a more modern group of adventurers to wander into a dungeon. It could be because there is a specific item of value in the dungeon, or the monsters themselves are causing problems for a local population, whether it's attacks or kidnappings. Or you could pull the old Lord of the Rings reverse quest and have them go into the dungeon to get rid of something they don't want anymore. Basically, a lot of players are going to expect more of a reason than maybe there's gold to go into a deep, dark cave full of monsters. Maybe put a bounty on the goblin's head or have the son of Duke Ashcroft stolen. Have them searching for the lost lore of the library of Archmagus Raquel. Maybe the only way to get to the Tower of Shirel in time to warn the Eastern Watch is to travel through the old road of Barir. Any plot that involves going into a dangerous location can be the hook for a dungeon crawl. I'm a big fan of the concept of verisimilitude. Basically, to contrast it with realism, realism is the idea that you want your game to be as much like the real world as possible, and you want your rules to model the real world. In a lot of ways, that doesn't sound like fun to me. I want to play a wizard, and if you've seen the magic tricks that real-world wizards do, they're pretty lame. For similitude is the idea that things are logically consistent within your story. That appeals to me more. I don't enjoy a sh superhero show where one week Superman can throw a bus, and the next week he has trouble lifting a dumpster. One situation just makes the other seem false by existing. So. I want to try and avoid that within the worlds I create. There are two big reasons I bring up the concept of verisimilitude. The first is the dungeon's architecture. When I run a dungeon crawl, I want to know who originally built the location. In a D&D &D game, a lot of times the monsters who live in the dungeon aren't the people who created it. So I'll decide what type of dungeon I want to run. My second step is generally to decide who built it. The goblins have infested the old iron mine. The Archmagus built her scriptorium to study her magic in peace. Aeons ago, Clan Berir built a city under the mountains and benefited from the trade that passed through, avoiding the dangerous weather in the passes above. You're working with a very different concept if you're dealing with the original inhabitants of the dungeon. Everything that's there is there because they put it there for their purposes. So if you have a citadel of hobgoblins at the top of the mountain, there are guard posts where they wanted guard posts. There are barracks where they wanted barracks. There are great halls where they wanted great halls and watchtowers built for their size, their tactics, and the way that they choose to live. However, if you're building a location that something else is in, then you build it based on the people who built it for its original purpose. So. I start by designing what the mine looked like as a mine. It's going to have a layout based on the needs of those miners, with mine offices, ore storage, tool sheds near the entrance, and then a bunch of long winding tunnels that follow wherever the miners could find ore. The scriptorium, meanwhile, has a meeting hall for visiting scholars, a library full of more common books, a vault with the rare books, a hidden laboratory, and the rooms for Raquel and her apprentices and servants. 
The road of Barir, meanwhile, suffered a massive earthquake that killed most of its citizens. There are the ruins of homes and businesses, inns, old forges and workshops, and then twisted tunnels that were dug by those who wandered in later, trying to extract the wealth of the old city or make a home amongst the remains of it. Part of the reasons I build my dungeons like this, thinking of the original intent of every room, is so that when the players travel through, if they are considering what this place used to be, they can develop some ideas about what might be next or what was the purpose of this room. Remember, the players don't have to be right. Maybe the players have no idea how Raquel's order laid out their libraries. Maybe the dwarves in the party are from a different clan than Berir and don't understand the choices that that clan made in their city. Players will have fun guessing, what was this room for? And if their characters should know, it's fair to provide them with additional information. Maybe locked behind the formality of a DC-5 history check. Ah, Clan Berir was famous for the lavish inns they set up for travelers, but the dwarves themselves slept in long bunk rooms, according to the tales your uncle used to tell you. If you know what each room was for and why it's there, then you have a level of internal logic, or verisimilitude, that makes it easier for players to understand or navigate your dungeon. Next, verisimilitude affects dungeon ecology. Dungeon ecology is the concept that if something lives in a dungeon, it has to have its needs met or access to a way to meet those needs outside of the dungeon. So when the goblins moved into the old iron mine, what do they do for food? Do they hunt rats and rabbits in the nearby countryside? Where do they sleep? Just pick a room and fill it with bedrolls. Where do they get water? Have they diverted an old stream? Dungeon ecology can change based on the denizens of your dungeon. If the Berea road is overrun by undead, the question starts to become what raised them because they aren't there necessarily to fill their own needs. It could be the work of a foul necromancer or just the seeping energy of a rift to the shadow fell. You should have an idea and use it to increase the internal consistency, but you don't have to share the reason with your players. Maybe they care and will investigate and start to find this shadow energy that is seeping in. Or maybe they'll look for the books left behind by the old necromancer. It could lead to a hook for a later adventure. It can be worth thinking about who has lived in this dungeon before the current inhabitants, apart from the original builders, especially if it's an older dungeon or you want to mix the type of monsters in there. Some monsters will have more supernatural needs. Do the demons that now infest the scriptorium squabble amongst themselves? Why don't they travel beyond its borders to corrupt mortals? Is there a barrier keeping them in place? While they don't need to eat, to my mind, demons have other needs, such as they're going to need to establish a pecking order, because any demons that don't bow to one of the biggest demons in there are going to be torn apart by those who manage to band together. Maybe the demons have a need to corrupt anyone who enters the scriptorium, and they try to seduce them or lead them down a dark path as soon as they come in contact with someone. The demons won't fight until the players start it, but they're trying to get whatever they can from any mortals who wander their way. So make sure to think about the inhabitants, needs, and behaviors of your denizens. You should put some thought into what each group needs, but also how they react to each other if you put multiple groups of monsters within your dungeon. When I say groups, I'm not talking about the wolves or rats that the goblins have trained to serve them. It's more, if there's an ogre in the back of the dungeon, how do the goblins react to him? Do the two groups care about each other? Has the ogre bullied the goblins into serving him? Have the goblins managed to overpower the ogre? and now he longs to be free of his servitude to them. When I add a Mind Flayer Arcanist to the Scriptorium, I need to figure out why the demons don't destroy him. Maybe the three groups of demons are gambling to see who can get the Ithalid on their side. Maybe the demons hurt any mortals towards the Ithalid because the fear caused by the Mind Flayer is the most delicious thing they can find within the Scriptorium walls. If a manticore lives amongst the Gaston ghouls on the road to Berir, where is its food supply from? You have to either give it a shaft to the surface or make the roof high enough that it can fly over their heads. 
How does it avoid them when it sleeps? Is it perched up on a ledge that they can't reach and actually uses them as part of its defense for its own den? So once you've figured out who's in the dungeon, then you need to figure out how they get around to the various parts they need. This doesn't have to be in a great deal of detail, but it does lead to something that I think is worth thinking about. Any locks that are in the dungeon mean that either someone has the key or someone needs to find another way around if they're going to be on the other side. So if you've got a locked door and it's the original inhabitants in the dungeon, that's not a worry. Someone within the dungeon has the key to get through there whenever they need to. However, if you put a locked door in the scriptorium, any demon on the other side probably hasn't been able to pass through since the door was locked. If you put a locked door on the road to Breer, are any undead on the other side trapped there since the door was last locked? Were they raised by the Shadowfell magic then? Are they something different than the rest of the undead? Is there another way around? If you're having one of your regular inhabitants pass the locked door, they need a way to have gotten there, even if it's they fell through a hole or the road collapsed after them. You just need to think about how they're there and how they're still surviving today. I find traps even more difficult for verisimilitude than locked doors. Again, if you're dealing with the original inhabitants, what traps have the hobgoblins placed in their dungeon? As a more military society, I figure they don't do a lot of unmanned traps. They might use something like a murder hole or arrow slits, but they're unlikely to have a scything blade on a door or a hallway full of pit traps. Now, if you're in the old mines, maybe the goblins have started to set up logs that swing if you break the trip wire or have dug pits and covered them. The goblins will also need a way to get around them, so if it's a well-traveled hall, it's less likely to be trapped unless you've got a very trap-filled type of denizen. When you have the undeads wandering around Barir, there really shouldn't be that many traps. Who would have put them there in a trade city? And if they did put them there, how did these stumbling monstrosities not manage to set them off? When you're looking at the scriptorium, maybe the demons reset the trap because they're demons and they think they're funny. I don't understand why there's so many scything blades or poison bolts in a lot of dungeons. If it's a castle that people live in, how did the people live there? Now, it's different if it's a drow castle, and that's part of their culture. They trap everything because that's how the drow of your world work. But if you're looking at just a human castle that's been taken over, any traps there might need to be added afterwards. I think we get a lot of this from our idea of ancient tombs. So when you have a Indiana Jones-style pyramid, it's supposed to be a resting place for the dead and you don't have a lot of monsters in there. I wouldn't recommend making this for most groups of players because it really only gives the rogue or maybe a bard or a monk something to do. If you're going to go trap heavy, you need to make sure that you've got a party that can deal with it. On the other hand, you should make sure you include traps at least once in a while because if someone's playing a rogue, They've probably invested some of the value of their character into thieves' tools and into perception checks for traps. So you need to give them a chance to use them. I just recommend thinking about who put the trap there and how the people who set the trap manage to not set it off when they do the things that the trap keeps other people from doing. Basically, in a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, a lot of traps are really dumb. So if you're outside of a fantasy setting, what does a dungeon crawl look like? In a modern or later setting, it could be the headquarters of an evil corporation, the spy-filled embassy of a foreign government, or the headquarters of a cult. A lot of the traps can be automated security systems, especially the locks. So if you don't have the key card and you open that door, you start to get a warning and then a turret lands, unless it's a very secure facility and they're willing to kill an accidental visitor. In a horror game, you could be looking at a haunted house and any traps are tricks from a ghost, or the den of a monster, where you're using this same sort of design philosophy you'd use in Dungeons and Dragons, so you set up an old factory and the werewolf deep inside. In a sci-fi game, you could be looking at an alien or an abandoned space station, 
a capital ship or a laboratory that went on full lockdown. Uh, again, a lot of robots work in areas where someone couldn't survive and automated security systems or glitch security systems make excellent traps. Basically, you're looking for any dangerous location where the inhabitants are likely to attack you if they discover you. There should be something of value in there, and you generally want this location to be constrained. You're looking at more of a hex map adventure if you're looking at a wide open dangerous location, which I'll probably cover in a later episode. Thanks for watching. If you want me to keep making these, please buy my book. The link is in the description down below. Already have it? Maybe a good friend needs it. Maybe tell someone it's good, even if you're lying to them. So thank you all for watching. Uh, please subscribe or leave a comment down below if there's a topic you'd like me to cover. Thanks. Bye. Ba 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 ba